This is the second of a fascinating interview of the father of an 11-year-old who, as we heard in part one, was hospitalized in the most antiquated and useless way for anorexia in Switzerland. This part is what happened next, so listen in to learn how very effective a family-based approach can be in treatment and how it worked for this little girl. I'm Eva Musby. I offer support to parents of someone suffering from anorexia or another eating disorder through my book, videos, training and one-on-one coaching. See the links in the notes. And if you'd like to download the audio of this interview, do check out a link in the notes as well. Note that I have produced other videos with a French version of this interview and it includes quite a lot of practical how-tos for French listeners. So, enjoy this heart-lifting interview. I must tell you that I got to know you first when you wrote on an English-speaking forum called aroundthedinnertable.org and you had so many English-speaking parents really rooting for you and really so shocked that your 11-year-old was being kept in isolation and that you could only visit one hour a week. So, people will be delighted to hear the rest of your story. Yeah, not as much as we are, but uh, yes, <laughs> of course. Tell us about how you changed things. I know you got yourself extremely well informed through parent forums and uh, a lot of readings. So how did you make change? So right first, through information and being convinced that there was another way, there was another alternative that was proven. So this was a very good news to us. It was not that this is not understood by no one and we just have to let go. It was very good, good news to know that there was an alternative it was even well protocoled and that many information were available, unfortunately only in English, which was okay in our case, but might be a hindrance for, for some other parents out there. So, so basically we got informed, we tried to open the dialogue with the hospital team about this alternative. Over the course of two months, we had uh, several face-to-face phone discussions, exchange of papers, scientific papers on the rationals behind it. And we were never allowed to really uh, have a dialogue. It was uh, just a one-way discussion. What you were putting in front of them was research on family therapy for eating disorders, where the parents are at the center of the treatment and the child is helped to eat. Actually, yes. So they were not interested. So what did you do after that? It's not that they were not interested, by the way. They said... Your daughter is too severely ill for that kind of approach. And this is hospital time. And later when she's better, this might be things we can discuss when she will be released from hospital. But these things are really experimental. She's too ill for that. It's not the right time. Again, be patient. Was your daughter very underweight at that stage? No, she was not underweight because of the the tube. She kept on gaining weight regularly thanks to the tube. So that was well managed. So she was medically safe at that stage, but they thought she was too much at risk for a family approach. Exactly. And what we could see is that, yes, physically she was much better than when entering the hospital in December, but mentally she was much worse. She had really deep dived into uh, some probably very nasty feelings in her head, around not only food, but the way she looked about being outside of the hospital. She started to fear the outside world. So mentally, she, she, was, uh, she was really doing bad. Yeah. Of course, this was uh, our main concern when we, when we saw her this uh, limited time and the fact that she didn't eat anything meal after meal. Okay, we were sure we would uh, go nowhere with that. And since the team did not want to... Uh, open the dialogue on how to treat her differently and not adapt anything in her present, uh, the way she was taken care of. Then we had to find an alternative. And uh, basically it took us two months to contact people in our area. And we found one service that was working with uh, older teens, 14 years old and and older. It was not... uh, inpatient uh, team but rather treatment at home and they had heard about family-based therapy they were not applying applying it strictly speaking but 
they, they knew the philosophy and were working towards these lines and working towards changing things to, to get something close to that. So um, this was a very good news. Although uh, still we could not just take our daughter out of the hospital and throw it in the hands of the other team and, uh, and just uh, change the, the treatment and, and, and try something that, that, have a chance, that has a chance to work, we, we had to really convince this, uh, this, the, this second team that uh, they could support us taking out of the hospital uh, a girl that did not eat for four months anything and that uh, needed serious uh, support the first minute she, she got out of the hospital. But it became clear it was the only way uh, forward. There was no way to work with the existing team. It was pretty clear we had to find an alternative, and this was uh, by far the, the best we had. So we, we just had to convince them that although she was too young for their service, uh, they were not used to such uh, extreme cases, we need, desperately needed to very quickly uh, uh, take her out of the hospital and, and give her a chance. And uh, it, it, it took us two months to do that, but we, we managed to get them on board, so to speak. Yes. And, um, and during those two months, you were really preparing yourselves very energetically to, to be ready to feed her once she got home, you got well informed. Yes, I think one thing that uh, we quickly realized is a sentence I saw for family treatment stating that the medical team is is mostly coaching the parents to do most of the work, except for the pediatrician, of course, who is looking after the, the physical health of, of the child. So yes, we could get ready in parallel by a lot of information you can find anywhere. So we, we knew we would have to stay home with our data when she got out of the hospital full time, 24 hours, support her through uh, meals and non-meals, and we got ready for it. So yes, that's right. We took also two months to really decide and, and, and motivate ourselves, uh, the full family, uh, her brother, my, my wife and I, to support her properly. And the team was more coaching us. So I, I felt good that finally we would have the major role and we could prepare ourselves alone for it with some coaching, but it was up to us. So that's what we did for, for these two last months of uh, hospitalization, yes. Yes. I remember speaking with you at the time and you were really, you were full of realistic uh, expectation about it not being easy, but you were also full of hope. It was justified hope. You were well ready. What was she like when she left this four months of isolation in the hospital? So I'm, I must say everything went wrong for the diagnosis, for the hospitalization and probably not by chance, but one week before we decided to tell her that she would get out of the hospital, things changed around for her, but she was kind of realizing she would not live there forever and also telling us that there was no way she would get better in the hospital. So this was our way to understand that she gave us green light to, to take her out, even if she was not eating, even if uh, doctors were saying that this was medically clearly not sound to do, but basically she, she showed us some interest in getting her out. And this was the final green light, go light we needed to, to, to tell her, okay, next week you, you will just leave the hospital. I remember you telling me that there had been one incident which seemed to have made her want to go out, a visit to a dentist. Exactly. This was the first time in four months she could leave the, the hospital unit. And going to that uh, meeting, which was a 20 minutes ride plus uh, an hour of meeting, and I think uh, she, she then stayed like 10 minutes uh, with my wife and then uh, had to go back to the unit. It's probably uh, she was smiling so much. She was going crazy seeing that uh, there was a life outside the, the hospital floor. Uh, she thought the car was moving too fast. The people were talking too fast, moving too fast. So everything seemed foreign to her after all this isolation, but she loved it. Mm. So I think this was also a, a small seed but she was very clear when we approached the day to tell her that we, we took the decision against the doctor's will to take her out of the hospital. She still was, I don't know if it's not enough, but she was still clear enough to tell us, I really want to go out. 
but there is no way I'm going to eat in the hospital under these conditions. Mm. No way. So the letting her go out was things were really turning around where she also felt some hope herself, but was sober enough to realize she would not do it alone. And, and that's, that was what we needed to hear, right? To, uh, to get her out and, and, uh, and, and give us a chance to, to have her eat again and, and get well, get better. So after four months of being fed only by nasogastric tube, you brought her home and you tried to get her to eat? Yes, of course. We, there was no tube, so there was no alternative. When we first explained to her exactly what would happen, we told her everything that happened until now you forget. Everything you heard about this illness you forget. It was a bad treatment. We will change things and do the polar opposite. And eating is the center of what we are going to put in place uh, when you get home. Food is your medicine. This is the only way you will have to get better. So you will need, first of all, to drink because she was not drinking. And not drinking meant two days later back into hospital. And uh, you have to eat at the same time because even if you have a little bit more margin now that you have gained weight through the, the, the tube, you still need to eat uh, right away, right? But we just told her that while she was still in the hospital, she knew exactly what would happen uh, at home and it happened. Did she so, agree to it when you told her yes. that in hospital? She agreed? Yes. She totally agreed. And that's why I say that she was seeing the light, I guess, and, and ready to be active, whereas she was completely passive in the hospital. So she agreed she would do it. Yes. Okay. Yes. And did it work? And it worked by magic for a period of time we called the honeymoon, right? Uh, we joked about this as I was talking to you and looking for some help at that time, pragmatic help on what to do at home. And during the first week, we didn't need much help because she ate everything we gave her. Variety, quantity, greasy, sugarly or not, doesn't matter. She ate everything and almost no resistance at uh, during meals. Uh, we were just... Uh, applying one or two uh, tools to make it easier, but it worked for one week, yes. <laughs> to go from four months of not eating and not drinking to a week of overnight eating what you're giving her is just, wow. Yeah, incredible. And, you know, even the team of the hospital was pretty sure we would get her re-hospitalized somewhere else after two days. And the team taking over also honestly told us it was a strong likelihood that yes. she would probably need to go back for a different kind of hospitalization, much shorter, but that going from nothing to not drinking to, to being able to start hope would be difficult. And uh, no, from um, one day to the other, as soon as we asked her to eat, which nobody did at the hospital. You know, we didn't mention that before, but they were rather saying, if you don't want to eat, you'll do it when you're ready to. Just hearing that not only did she have to eat, but there was no other choice and all the, the support we could provide around that, it worked, yes. So the honeymoon lasted for a week and then the hard work started? Yes, the hard work started. She, she started to restrict mainly the variety to a point where she was eating only liquid stuff. So it was soups, milkshakes, and fruit, uh, fruit shakes. And um, we kind of got into this bad circle of uh, you do things at one meal and the next one, no way you're going, going back because we realized this illness is, you know, fighting and then... Um, Anything you, you give in is, uh, is granted. It's very difficult to, to go back once you go in the wrong direction. So during this tough period, we still managed to get her not to lose too much weight because we were charging quite heavily the things she would eat and uh, without her knowing what was inside, right? This was the principle we used, her not being involved in, uh, in the food. So we managed to do that, to do that, but it was not sustainable for, for the long term, of course. So that's where the, the team that was coaching us became very uh, helpful. Uh, part of the support of this team was psychological for her to, to get through this tough period. But another kind of support was about really how 
make meals happen. And at some point, the doctor, who was not aware of exactly how it was happening at home when she found out, all of us being in the same room with her, she, she just said, no way, we are continuing this way. You will need to eat like uh, all other uh, child of your age. And your parents are doing a, a tremendous work and they need some of your help now also because if you are not helping them a little bit, it's going to be very tough. And I think this was for her probably... Uh, the switching point as well as she realized probably we were doing a lot of effort to to help her and that uh, she could also help us too in return and and she wanted that deep inside probably. So we went back home and we started again on the right track. You gave her solid food and not just uh, smoothies and, and soups. Yeah, from one day to the other, we actually, we gave her an apple at the same moment we were speaking when we got out of the doctor's appointment where we discussed that we gave her an apple that was present at the waiting room you know so we right away changed things and she was okay with that yeah i guess to hear it and and to jump into it without second thought without waiting for even getting home so then we started again with solid food and the full variety of uh, things that uh, she needed except meat I must say that meat was the thing that she was not willing to eat whatsoever. This was kind of like the the last remnants of what she had been uh, struggling uh, for regarding food before it it was meat. So we could introduce everything except meat. But you could get her to eat the quantities that was needed and a lot of variety, everything except meat. Exactly. And Um, with that, you got the support of this second team. You got family meetings, you were respected as competent parents? Yes, totally. This team was really, and and is still, really working along the line of uh, the philosophy of family-based treatment. Yes, totally. Fantastic. Okay, so it's seven or eight months since she's left hospital. So how is she now? Um, Now she's doing fantastically better. So regarding food, she is even eating meat. It took some time, but now she is eating uh, meat. And she is eating the variety and the quantity we give her. During these uh, eight months, there's been meals that were going extremely well, others uh, with more difficulties, but the trend is systematically better. And after eight months, we, we let her deal with some of the meals alone in the sense that she can help herself or take whatever she wants and she is managing that but for other meals the most important ones of the day we still manage it for her so it means that she still has a lot of support it's not always easy to eat but it's definitely manageable she definitely has the resources and the competencies to do it and it seems to be going steadily with our strong uh, support Next step will be to to allow her to just uh, feed herself when she needs to without so much support from 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 the parents, right? But this is steady steady improvements all the way through the eight months for for this uh, for matters relating to eating and to her weight. She's weight restored completely, back to her historical curve which we we had track of, so we knew exactly uh, since she was born what was her. The ideal weight, let's say. She, she's very fine on that. And she's happy? She's back she, at school? Yes, okay. she's happy. Now, I don't want to paint the perfect picture where this illness was just an incident of a few months and everything is gone. No, things are not like before. They are so much better that at hospital she's really convalescent. She's still in good hands and in good care and she still needs it. Basically, of course, she eats well and she's physically well, but she's still recovering and convalescent from from that illness. She still has body image issues. She's quite stressed out with school or sport because these are probably things that are interleaved into this illness, which is not only about food and only food. So she's happy most of the time. She still is sometimes not. She's still uh, seeing her coach for eating, her psychotherapists, and we are still deeply involved. 
So she, she still has a lot of care and support. She's constantly doing better. From what I hear, after eight months, it's already incredible that she's so well, but yes. she's still far from being all the time herself of before the illness. And I believe things will always be a little bit different, right? right? Yes, yes or no, we don't know. She may be completely okay. back to where she would have been without the illness. Mm. That's probably silly to think because she's had life experiences in between. Yeah. Yes, the studies on family-based treatment are on treatment lasting six, nine or 12 months and show the proportion of people who recover fully during that six, nine or 12 months. But a lot of people need longer. And I think you are really on track from what you're describing. Mm. Has she kept any traumas from these four months of isolation? I believe mainly the tube. She's disgusted to think that she was fed by a nasogastric tube now. And probably this is the main trauma she has. Now on being isolated, separated, no school, no friends and all this. As we said before, I'm convinced she was in another world and another time. So she has just turned the page. I'm pretty sure she will never want to hear about hospitals again, but I would not say that she has trauma because of the isolation. For a short while after the hospital, she was, as I said, afraid of speed, afraid of bees and all those kind of things that might be related to the hospital, but these are things that are settling with time, right? But after eight months, what remains is probably... uh, a strong disgust for the way she was fed. Mm. That's what she expressed, she's expressing. How is her relationship with you and your wife? Excellent, really. We already were quite a tight family before and um, she has always been the type of wanting to please the parents and not entering into conflict. So she was quite a nice girl in terms of, you know, Parents, no, no hassle, no worry, uh, thinking. Now, I'm not, I don't mean this is good, but this is the way she was, and she's basically the same now. Mm. And in the last two months, she could really express gratitude to us, even for the difficult times where we had to just be firm on making her do things she didn't want to, like eating. So she, she already realized that uh, it was the only way out. It was made out of love and she could express it. Uh, even she, she wrote us letters to, to both of us, uh, the parents lately, stating that. Although, as we said, she's still recovering, right? But so the relationship is very good. It's very good. Wow. And she can already appreciate the the kind of intervention that you made and how you cared for her. Yeah, and funnily enough, today she saw her psychotherapist for the last time of this year and she brought her, she insisted on bringing her a gift and and wrote also a, a small memo saying that despite the time they got mad or she got mad, she knows what she did for her and she's thanking her as well. Yes, I wonder if gratitude is a a very strong element in many of our children who are recovering or have recovered. That's one way they're changed forever. Mm -hmm. Is there a message you'd like to give to the people who are listening whose child may be treated in the kind of old-fashioned, unverified treatment that your daughter experienced? Well, people say it took us a lot of courage to just uh, take her out against the uh, doctor's will. But at the end, I think the parents, they have the guts to understand what is best and to do what is best for their children. So let's not be afraid of challenging. And if challenging is not enough, of organizing an alternative and just make things change. The worst is probably to sit and wait months after months. I know for the hospital we went to average stay was six months and there were cases with 15 months. This is not a sign of any therapy that is uh, nearly efficient, right? So don't wait, but prepare an alternative. The goal is not to be unprepared, to not have an alternative with a strong support with a pediatrician and all this. But we believe this was the only way out 
We are sure that it was the only way out. And I'm so happy we, we made it happen. And that's what I would recommend to any parent. There are so many places I know of in Europe where these new therapies are not known. People are not familiar with them. So it's really up to the parents to, to make it happen because they are in the front line for giving a chance to, to their children. So do yes. it, get informed and do it. No, no waiting or blind trust to, to existing doctors or teams that are misinformed or where things are not working fine, not progressing. Family treatment, family-based treatment for eating disorders has been subject to research since the 1990s. So it's hardly new. We can direct parents or professionals who are listening to so many resources to get them up to speed very, very fast if they're not already well-versed on all this. So I will put some links. But in the English-speaking world, it's very easy. There are so many resources. In the French-speaking world, it's harder. And that's why we made a longer interview together in French, hoping that this will help bring change in the French-speaking world. Thank you so much for spending the time to tell us about what you did and how you did it. Thank you a lot, Eva, and so for all your support.